Okay, and welcome to another live session for Astronomy State of the Art, fielding mm -hmm. questions from comets to cosmology, pretty much anything you want to ask about. So one of the things that I wanted to mention from the background was that this um, live broadcast is going to be a little bit more delayed than uh, normal, so we may not have the same kind of direct um, responses to questions that people post on uh, the board. So just maybe remind the students of that once or twice during the broadcast that, that, that there is a bit of a delay, and so that's why it what end up being there is. Right. So <clears throat> apparently Google has a lot of latency built into their video system. More than the six-second delay, you know, worrying about people having potty mouth. This is something even more profound, apparently. So the first question is online from uh, an email by Rick. And Rick asks, how has the course been received? Uh, he is in the UK. And has there been much interest from foreign countries? Uh, yes. I mean, I get quite a lot of feedback. Um, you know, the numbers in principle in this course are, are massive. Um, we're up at close to 6,300. And um, pretty typical of MOOCs. Uh, in general, you know, some substantial fraction of those are people who maybe just dipped into it for a little while, it wasn't to their liking, or they're just sampling the material, or they're not heavily engaged. That's pretty standard for a MOOC. Um, you know, it's free, you're not getting credit or university credit afterwards, so it's perhaps lower stakes, perhaps, than a normal course. So modulo that, I think the interest is pretty high. We have a lot of people, Carmen, works with us on this project, she can give numbers, but we've got a lot of activity in the social media side, so on the Facebook page, and uh, the Twitter is getting quite a lot of attention, and the Q&A um, question and answers on the Udemy site, um, it's, a, it's a pretty steady, a steady stream, so I'd say interest level is good. It's always a little tricky to have one of these disembodied courses. I am a classroom teacher and have been for 30 years, and so my really my preferred situation is a classroom, a, a direct one-on-one -on -one or one on a number of people, face-to-face -face contact. So this is a little hard for me as well as maybe for some of the people out there who might want a closer connection with the instructor. But given all that, I think it's uh, it's good. And the to answer your question about international, um, Udemy doesn't you know ask for country of origin. Um, I've crunched, I've sort of sampled the statistics of three or four hundred participants, and best I can estimate about 40% are from overseas, um, you know, dozens of countries, literally. And just a quick reminder that if you have any questions, please post them in the sidebar. Um, so we'll try and keep reminding you of that throughout the session, so feel free to ask questions. All right, our next question um, is from someone who is interested in cosmology classification. Basic idea is to classify, um, uh, or talk about, um, actually I'm not sure, um, talk about galaxy classification and how that works and why you classify galaxies. It's an interesting and long history of the subject of galaxy classification because, of course, it was started by Hubble back when we first learned that galaxies were distant systems of stars, so 1929, basically. Um, so galaxy classification is almost 100 years old. Uh, Hubble noticed the very dramatic distinction in galaxy morphologies, especially between spirals, which have tend to have blue stars, spiral arms, thin disks, and then also an older, redder population in the center, which we call the bulge, and then a much more diffuse almost spherical population called the halo. And galaxies that didn't seem to have the young stars or the disks or the gas and dust. And they were sort of ellipsoidal in shape. Um, and those were the ellipticals. So that binary distinction was in place very early on when we only had photographic plates and were looking at hundreds of galaxies instead of hundreds of millions, the way we do now. Um, the, there's always been a third category, which is sort of a catch-all, really, irregular is the category of galaxies that don't have any classical shape, like a spiral pattern or a elliptical, almost symmetric. 
they're raggedy, and they tend to be smaller. They're dwarf galaxies, and some have gas, and some have no gas. Um, the Magellanic Clouds, the two neighbor galaxies to the Milky Way, are the, are the nearest examples, which in the southern sky you can see easily with the naked eye. So there have always been these three basic categories of galaxies. Hubble uh, attempted to relate them with a tuning fork classification scheme, and he actually uh, believed that galaxies evolved from one to another. And that turned out not to be strictly true. So people classified galaxies initially in the time of Hubble and his work as a, as a way of understanding them physically, and, and they hoped to be able to interrelate these very different morphologies. Now we know that galaxies of different types probably form in different circumstances because um, spiral galaxies tend to form in lower density regions of the universe. They form from initial gas clouds that have a fair amount of rotation, which is why you end up with a disk. Uh, and elliptical galaxies tend to form in higher density regions of the universe, uh, and they form with very low angular momentum, almost absent angular momentum, in which case they collapse almost spherically, and you end up with a nearly spherical system. So we think largely that the difference between these major types of galaxies is due to initial conditions. So, that, so, the, so the view shifted from Hubble's one galaxy turns into another over time to the more modern view, well, it's a function of initial conditions in different cosmic environments and physical situations at the starting point. Now that line has got blurred in the last couple of decades because really computer simulations have told us, and I think one of these type of simulations is, is represented in the course, computer simulations have shown us that when in high, moderately high density regions of the universe where spiral galaxies can interact and merge sequentially over time, you can actually uh, get an elliptical galaxy from the collision and merger of two or more spiral galaxies. So we don't get to see that happening in real time. It takes tens or hundreds of millions of years for that to occur. But we can simulate it with computers and we can see in frozen form out there in the universe, different stages of the spiral galaxy approach, merger, and coalescence process. And indeed, it seems likely that ellipticals could form from the merger and, uh, of two or more spiral galaxies, plus lots of smaller pieces because there are many more dwarf galaxies than normal sized galaxies. So galaxies do evolve and change over time, and in that particular example, they can change from one type to another. So we've learned a lot about galaxies. The, the last thing we've been learning with things like the Hubble Space Telescope and facilities that take us back in cosmic time is that our theory of how galaxies form or how structure grows in the universe uh, is that the big things grow from smaller pieces. And we see very good signs of that in the universe because if we look back in cosmic time, we see that there's an era before which you do not see classically fully formed galaxies like the Milky Way or M87, the classic giant elliptical galaxy. Far more, there are a few galaxies like that, but far more of the galaxies in the early universe, first billion years or so, are, are small pieces. They're dwarfs. They're rapidly star forming. They're blue. They're um, uh, they're ragged looking, not symmetric, and so uh, galaxies do evolve over time by this process of mergers, hierarchical structure formation, as it's called. And by taking a telescope, big ground-based telescope, or the Hubble Space Telescope, we can look back in cosmic time and watch the evolution of the galaxy population. And it's really morphology, or the shape and structure, that's telling us what's going on. So it's a very rich subject. And I would say it's I'm working in a loose related field. I would say there are hundreds of research astronomers working on galaxy morphology. Okay, just a quick reminder to everybody that's joined us or that's uh, with us right now um, that we're on quite a bit of a delay. Um, there seems to be about a 30 second um, delay um, with the Google Hangout between what you're seeing and what's going on here um, in Tucson. So make sure you submit those questions um, through the Google Hangout. So the next question is from Julian. Um, and it says, distant galaxies. We've had the furthest confirmed galaxy last week. I think redshift of seven or something. Um, how are these resolved and measured? 
Right. Uh, that's right, Julian. Uh, the press release just this past week. Um, they're the highest redshift galaxy in the Guinness Book of Records sense is, is a, a title that astronomers kind of vie for. It's very competitive. And actually, there were there have been higher redshift galaxies claimed in the past. There was actually a redshift 10 galaxy claimed a few years ago, I think 2009, but it turned out not to be correct. So at that sort of cutting edge of the research, people sometimes claim to have found the highest redshift and it sort of evaporates because the data just wasn't quite good enough. This one seems like it's pretty good. People have looked at the data. So the redshift 7, or a little higher than 7, is indeed the furthest that a galaxy has been found where we totally trust the result. What redshift 7 means is that uh, in the expansion of the universe, the size of the universe then, relative to now, is a factor of 1 plus c, 1 plus the redshift. So the galaxy with a redshift 7 means that the universe was 1 plus 7, 8 times smaller when that light was emitted than it is now. That's, that's amazing. The other thing you can do is use a Big Bang model to calculate the look-back time, or the age of the universe when that light was emitted, that we detect now with our telescopes. And that's less than half a billion years. So with this galaxy, you're doing something pretty extraordinary. You're looking back to the universe when it was almost an order of magnitude smaller, which means you know, almost a thousand times denser, and about that same factor, an order of magnitude hotter. Uh, and you're looking back within 5% uh, of the age of the universe toward, towards the Big Bang. So that's how valuable a, even a single galaxy of this redshift is. Now, the other thing that's interesting is, well, I should answer the question of how do we know the galaxies that that redshift since there have been some false alarms. Well, typically it's going to be done with spectroscopy. So these are faint galaxies when they're that far away, and it's a real challenge to measure a spectrum because rather than just making an image, you have to smear the light into a spectrum and disperse it, and, and they're faint, and the sky is not absolutely black. So the challenge is really getting a good spectrum. By a reg at a redshift of 7, you're typically looking for hydrogen lines that, are, that normally would fall in the local universe, would fall in the vacuum ultraviolet, that have been redshifted by that same factor of 8, into the red part of the optical spectrum. And that's indeed where the lines for this galaxy were found, and also in the near infrared. Um, and because more than one spectral line was seen, it's a pretty secure redshift. Occasionally in the past, people have made redshift claims based on one spectral line, where they just saw it was a very strong line, so they assumed it had to be, say, the Lyman alpha line, the strongest hydrogen line. And that's a fairly good assumption, but it's still an assumption, and so that's a little dangerous. This galaxy has multiple spectral lines, and the pattern uniquely fits the redshift that they claim. So I think the redshift is reliable, and that's how you measure it. Now, the other thing you want to look at when you find even a single galaxy at this redshift is what is the state of this galaxy? And I think the interesting thing about this galaxy and the handful of others at similar redshifts is that they're, they're quite massive galaxies. In fact, if they weren't massive and forming a lot of stars, you'd never detect them at that incredible distance. Uh, but that itself creates an interesting issue because you've only, in the previous uh, question, I was talking about how structure grows sequentially from small to large pieces. Well, you've only had less than half a billion years to grow a massive galaxy. And in the history of the universe, that's quite a challenging thing to do, to, to smash together or merge enough small pieces uh, that you can end up with a, a, a galaxy like this, which is at least as massive as the Milky Way, but it's seen a very long time ago when the universe was young. So we have to be careful about drawing too many conclusions from a single galaxy or handful that are known at this kind of redshift. But seeing uh, a fully-fledged massive galaxy forming a ton of stars at this redshift is very interesting. Some people have even claimed that if we see a massive enough galaxy at a high enough redshift, it could refute or challenge the Big Bang model. And that technically is true, because our model of cosmology assigns an age to the universe, and our model of how structure forms by gravity probably gives you a maximum rate of growing something. And if you find something too big, too, too early, then that's indeed a problem for the Big Bang. So the Big Bang and our standard cosmology has not been challenged in that way, but it's yet another motivation for people to try and push the limit and find high redshift galaxies. Right, the next question is, 
from Wayne. In the Active Galaxies lecture, you discussed Schmidt's results that quasars started to form around three billion years ago, reaching a peak shortly after red, or sorry, shortly after, and then declining in number. While the decline is due to the lack of material to fuel quasars, why was there a delay in their formation? Yeah, very. That's a good question. So the the uh, curve that is one of the graphics in that lecture just it's a it's a kind of smooth idealized version of the history shows that the the epoch of quasar activity has a particular time and it's it's not recent it's in the early third history of the universe and then declines well the growth of quasar activity relates to the fact that as galaxies are growing in this hierarchical way from smaller pieces to larger pieces um, the black holes within them are growing in the same way. So if you're going to get a quasar, that is a, an incredibly luminous object that's putting out hundreds or maybe even thousands of times the energy of an entire galaxy, all from its central region, you have to grow a black hole that's at least 100 million solar masses to do that. And it takes a while for that to happen. Uh, the most massive black holes are, are actually several billion times the mass of the sun. So basically, the the lag in the peak of the quasar epoch relates to the time that it takes to grow the most massive black holes. Now, that doesn't take too long, and when that has happened, when those massive black holes have been grown, there's still plenty of gas left to fuel those quasars. And so all the ingredients are there for an incredibly lively period of the universe. When you've grown your massive black holes, there's plenty of gas left around in those galaxies. Uh, to fuel them, and that's the peak of the quasar era, and it's incredibly luminous. Um, remember, all galaxies we think have these black holes, and in that period of time, either those most of those black holes were active, or they were active for a large fraction of their time rather than a small fraction of their time. So, what happens to change that? Um, two things happen. First, the universe is getting more diffuse; it's ex continuing to expand. So the ability for galaxies to grab new material to fuel the black holes in their nuclei diminishes. There are less of uh, the dwarf galaxies no longer are falling into the big galaxies. The big spirals are not merging nearly as often. And so the fuel for nuclear activity um, is diminishing steadily with time. Uh, and that's, that's the primary issue that causes the decline of the quasar era. And that's a very steady thing. And that's happened steadily for the last six or eight billion years. The black holes were built, and so the second thing, I mentioned two things. The second thing, of course, is that the low interaction rate and the lack of the availability of stars and gas in the centers slows down the growth rate of the black holes. So in the first phase of the universe, you have tons of material, tons of interactions and mergers, and very rapidly growing black holes. In the second phase, you have uh, diminishing interactions, diminishing mergers, a lesser amount of fuel, because more of it's been built into stars already. Um, and of course, the black holes then grow at a much slower rate. So they're growing, growing at a much slower rate, and there's very little for them to eat. And that just keeps continuing to the present day, the universe now, very large and dispersed. Um, and so the current situation, all those black holes still exist. Their days of growth are mostly behind them, although they will, of course, grow slowly. Black holes. Uh, they do evaporate according to Stephen Hawking, but those massive ones take a ridiculous time to evaporate. So basically black holes can only get bigger, but they get bigger at a very, very slow rate in the last few billion years. And there's not so much for them to eat. Most of the gas has been used up. It's been locked into stars. There's little available. The galaxies aren't being fueled by mergers. And so you have a decline by factors of hundreds in the level of nuclear activity compared to those, those early days in the universe. Next question is kind of a big one. And so this is good. Next question is what research are you currently working on and what other research is taking place at the University of Arizona? Well that second question is so big I couldn't possibly answer it, but I, I will give some highlights. Um, in my own case, um, because of courses like this and the fact that I run the academic program for our fairly large department, I, I don't get to spend all my time on research. I'm down to about 
day and a bit a week for research. Um, and also I do research on things like science literacy and um, pedagogy and education things too, so I've sort of spread my bets a little bit. My main research that uses our telescopes and that involves material from this course is on the co-evolution of galaxies and their supermassive black holes, so pretty much the subject that we were just talking about. Um, I am part of a survey called the Cosmos Survey, which was based on a, uh, a survey that the Hubble Space Telescope did a couple of years ago, where the Hubble sort of mosaiced with 800 different postage stamp pointings a two square degree region of sky. It doesn't sound like much, but for Hubble, that's the biggest single area it ever surveyed to this depth. And that's the raw material for a wonderful survey that looks at both galaxies and their supermassive black holes, because the project involves the co-evolution of the way they grow together. Do the galaxies grow quicker than their embedded black holes or slower? What is it that fuels the black holes and triggers them? Why is it that they're only active some fraction of the time? Uh, is the primary triggering mechanism from fuel close to the nucleus, very close, where it can really go into an accretion zone? Or is the primary trigger interactions in larger scale astrophysics on the scale of galaxy-galaxy pairs and, and clusters? So a whole set of questions there. And the other thing is, uh, what is the nature of what's going on near the beast? We use multi-wavelength data of this cosmos region of the sky, which is to say we've got everything from radio maps all the way out to X-ray, hard X-ray observations, to try and get the full energy output of these black holes because they pump out energy across the electromagnetic spectrum. So we're measuring the total energy output of the black holes. We're measuring their mass, which we do with spectroscopy, optical spectroscopy, and we're measuring their accretion rate. We're measuring how fast they're generating radiant energy from gravitational potential energy. And then we're trying to relate all those properties to the large-scale galaxy distribution and how galaxies are behaving and growing by this hierarchical merger process. So it's a pretty ambitious set of projects. And I, I usually just have one grad student working on this at a time. And I'm really only able to publish one or two papers a year on that science. But it's a fun project. And it's a great collaboration. At Stewart, uh, there's just so much to talk about, and I, I'm not going to. Um, I have uh, 25, 26 faculty colleagues, and they're all doing cool stuff. Um, some of the most exciting things, which I think I managed to get into the course, involve our use of adaptive optics, and um, and that is facilitating a lot of different types of science, of course. So I, I showed that we've taken the sharpest image of the sky ever made ground-based or space-based, just within the last couple of months. And just to give it a very great currency, I would mention that that same group, led by my colleague Larry Close, um, has actually imaged a, an exoplanet at a, a distance of 600 astronomical units. So they're using imaging now to find exoplanets. And their, their first one that they found in their last observing one was at this kind of crazy distance, 600 astronomical units. Remember, Jupiter's at five. So, and, and they're pretty sure it's not an interloper or some background object. So we didn't think solar systems were that big, and so that's a bit of a surprise. And that's just literally one thing, because there's a lot of research going on here. There's also some nice theory going on here. I have colleagues who work on um, the equation of state of neutron stars and the very detailed astrophysics of neutron stars and compact objects like black holes. I have other colleagues who work on astrophysical simulations of large-scale structure, um, the kind of thing I've been talking about from an observational standpoint, where they work on simulating. And, and some of those simulation animations, uh, beautiful animations that they produce, are in the course, too. So really too big a question to answer. Stewart is, is an amazing place for doing research. We have so many telescopes. We have so many faculty. We have um, 30 postdocs. 40 grad students, 100 astronomy majors, and almost all of them are doing research. So that's a lot of research going on here. Okay, the next question is from Aurora. And she asks, what caused, what caused Neptune and Uranus to switch places in our solar system? And what else can knock a planet off of its path? Yeah, good question. Um, the the, the true answer is we don't exactly know, because this is uh, planetary archaeology. 
Um, this is something that we think happened 3.8 to 3.9 billion years ago, so within the first 10% of the age of the solar system. Um, and the evidence for it is certainly indirect, because you know, that, that's the only evidence we have now. So much time has passed. But, if, and, it, and it's facilitated really by simulations and models, computer simulations where you generate the current solar system and you essentially can wind the clock back with very accurate calculations of the orbits, which show whether they're stable or unstable. If you look at the solar system now, the solar system now is, is what dynamicists would call quasi-stable. It's mostly stable, but it's not long-term stable in the sense of uh, tens of billions of years. So the solar system is stable on the time scale of tens of millions or even hundreds of millions of years. If you just run the orbits of the planets forward that length of time, really nothing is going to change. But if you run it forward billions of years or tens of billions of years, things could change. Similarly, if you run it back in time, you do predict that there are situations where um, soon after the planets formed, or relatively soon after the planets formed, um, they could have rearranged positions. And the key thing that causes planets to shuffle their positions are orbital resonances. And we see the effect of orbital resonances playing out in the moons of the solar system in particular, but it can also happen with planets. So resonance is, is simple to describe. Um, it's just a situation where the ratio of the orbital periods of two consecutive planets, say, or it could be two consecutive moons around the planet, uh, is the ratio of whole numbers. So the ratio of the periods could be 2 to 1, or 3 to 1, or 4 to 1, or 3 to 2, or 5 to 3, any ratio of integers. What that means is that if the orbital periods are ratios of integers, that means that every every certain number of orbits, lowest common denominator between the two numbers, basically, they will align. And what that means is that in the orbital dynamics, you get an extra little gravitational nudge, an extra push, because of the alignment of the two orbits. And because that happens sequentially, every certain number of orbits, over a long period of time, that adds up to a lot of little nudges or pushes. And so this orbital resonance phenomena can lead planets to be kicked out of their seemingly stable positions. And that's what we think happened. We think that in the early phase of a solar system where there was just natural and steady migration happening, Uranus and Neptune hit one of these resonances. I think it was a 3 to 2 resonance, actually. And that put them into an unstable situation where the outcome in this case was that they swapped positions. Now, you could have other outcomes. Once you go into an unstable situation due to resonance, all sorts of things could happen. A planet could get ejected from a solar system, and we've made models or simulations that show that that can happen. So that could have been one of the outcomes in our solar system, but in this, we don't think it was. So um, that's the supposition. It's a, it's a fairly good supposition, but it's not proven beyond a reasonable doubt. However, in general, the situation will occur in solar systems of all kinds of, of these resonances. And they become a mechanism for kind of dramatic and unstable things happening within a planetary system. Orbit swapping, things being ejected, and so on. Shuffling of the planets. Uh, and that's uh, an interesting field of research. All right, just another quick reminder to people that we are on a bit of a delay, so um, go ahead and post questions in the question and answer space um, in the Google Hangout window, and we will get to them in order. The next question is uh, one that was sent in from Rick via email, and it is, what will be the initial priorities of the James Webb Space Telescope once it is launched, and how is time using this telescope allocated? It's good questions. Um, to, to answer the second question first, um, most of the NASA's great observatories or NASA's telescopes in space have time allocated in a very similar way. Uh, it's all by peer review. It's competitive. Um, the panels who adjudicate the awarding of time are composed of astronomers from the research community. Uh, and a lot of people do this. Uh, I think every year the Hubble Space Telescope comprises something like eight or nine panels with 10 or 12 astronomers on each one. 
So there's 150 or so people involved in allocating time on the Hubble every year. And James Webb will be very similar. It'll be a large number of astronomers meeting in peer review panels, subdivided by topics. So there'll be a solar system panel, a star formation panel, a nearby universe or the Milky Way panel, a cosmology, and so on clusters of galaxies. It just gets subdivided by the proportion of proposals in each category. Um, so that, that's, and then the other important thing about these peer review processes, uh, they're run, they're orchestrated by NASA, but NASA has no skin in the game. They're not invested. They're just managing this process. It's really the community of researchers that decides who among them will get the time. These proposal processes are supposed to be uh, blind. You know, they're, um, you're not allowed to serve in a panel if you're conflicted, which means you can't be, you're not going to be on a panel where one of your proposals or a proposal of your graduate student or a person you studied with is being judged. You can't even be a judge of a proposal that has a collaborator on it that's on your panel. So NASA is incredibly strict about conflict of interest because they don't want any bias in the process. So when you sit in that room judging these proposals, of which only one in six, one in seven, with JWST, it'll be similar, will get time, you can be fairly sure that um, you know, you're just looking at science and just thinking, wow, how good is this proposal? You do know the proposer's names, of course. It's not anonymous. But you don't have conflict of interest. So that's the process. And that process doesn't uh, judge for or against any particular type of science. It's driven by proposal pressure. In other words, if the community as a whole just decides that exoplanets are hot and, and they put in 40% of proposals to James Webb in its first year are for exoplanets and they're all assuming they're all as good as a typical cosmology proposal or a typical star formation proposal, then 40% of the time on the James Webb will be on exoplanets. So the science done by these facilities is key entirely to the proposal pressure, subject to peer review, uh, and that's how the time is awarded. It's kind of nice, which means that it can change from year to year. And for Hubble, the balance of subjects that Hubble studied has not changed dramatically, but it has changed. And when a new field emerges, like exoplanets, of course, it, it comes along and starts to get a significant amount of time. So to answer the first question, we know going in that characterizing exoplanets is going to be a very major piece of what JWST does. That science did not even exist when JWST was designed or planned. Um, and so the initial science cases made for the telescope didn't even mention exoplanets because we didn't know they existed. But exoplanets do exist and JWST turns out to have some interesting capabilities for their study. And so we can anticipate that maybe, I'm going to guess, a third of the time on JWST will be going for that kind of science. I would guess another third of the time is going to go on another thing that was known as one of its high priorities, which is the detection of first light, the very first galaxies or stellar systems in the universe. Going back within that 5% of the age of the Big Bang, that, that we talked about the rich of seven galaxy, well, JWST is designed to push that boundary to the limit, to the highest redshift possible, which may be redshift 10, 12, 15, we don't actually know. And that is, was already, that's a hot field anyway, and it was known to be a hot field when JWST was designed. So I'm going to guess another third of the time will go for that type of science. And I would say all the other fields of astrophysics will be, you know, vying for the, the other third of JWST's time. That's just a guess, actually. I don't know how the proposals will come in, because nobody does. It depends on what, basically, in two years from now, when astronomers start writing their proposals for that first cycle of time on the telescope. It just depends on what great ideas they come up with and what those ideas are to study. The only exception to this peer review driven by proposal pressure and just ideas from the community is that when you make the enormous investment of time, energy, and money to build an instrument for one of these telescopes, Hubble, Spitzer, Chandra, or JWST, any of these big NASA telescopes in space, you get a certain amount of what's called GTO. Time. So guaranteed time observations because of the fact that you built an instrument. So that investment of time essentially guarantees you some observing time. And so those instrument teams get to sort of peel off the top 
um, a small fraction of the total telescope time. It's usually only 10% of the total resource, but that's a lot, um, for their own science. And they get to decide what they do with that science. The scientists who built those instruments get to do what they want with their GTO time. Um, so that's the only exception to pure peer review, but it's a it's a legitimate reward for people who have made their instrument, of course, available for the rest of the 90% of the time that they're not using it. It's available to every astronomer who have nothing to do with making that instrument. So it's a it's a good situation. It benefits everyone. Okay, our next question is from Julian. There are radio loud and radio quiet quasars. What process makes them loud or quiet in the radio? Good, yeah, good question, Julian. Um, and and a mystery, originally. I mean, a long-standing mystery because the first quasars discovered were radio sources. It was the radio, the compact radio mission that keyed optical astronomers to point their telescopes. Martin Schmidt already mentioned in this session. Um, point a big optical telescope there and see that there was an object with an amazing redshift that must be a very luminous distant galaxy with a massively bright thing in the center. So the radio mission keyed that discovery of quasars initially. Uh, and it was known right from the beginning, right from the mid to early 1960s, that the radio mission must be synchrotron emission, which is essentially uh, very high energy emission from electrons spiraling in a magnetic field. So the radio observations right back from the start implicated very strong magnetic fields and relativistic, very close to the speed of light motion of electrons, and therefore also probably a plasma, because it must be high temperature. So that ingredient was understood to be there right back to the 60s. Now then what happened through the 60s was that people discovered how to find quasars without reference to their radio emission, and they suddenly found, over a period of only a few years, that there were 10 times more quasars that had no feeble or absent radio emission than had strong radio emission. So the thing sort of flipped. And by the 1970s, astronomers were aware that radio emission uh, was a, a slightly rare uh, situation in quasars. Most of them did not emit radio waves. So it sort of depends on how you want to approach the question. Do you want to say, why is there radio emission at all? Or why is the radio emission so rare? Well, let's flash forward to more recent information. Um, we've been studying quasars for decades, and we've got exquisite radio interferometers to do it and powerful optical telescopes. So the overall demographics have not changed. 90% of radio of quasars, quasi-stellar objects, are radio quiet, and the radio loud fraction is a small fraction. It now seems that most likely this, the fraction that are radio loud form in the most massive stellar systems, which tend to be elliptical galaxies. And people have now just given a phrase to this radio mode accretion, which is the mechanism whereby, as the accretion occurs in the center of that galaxy, it's in a phenomenally deep gravitational potential. Because elliptical galaxies have extremely high densities in their centers. They tend to grow the most massive black holes because they're the most massive galaxies. So we're talking hundreds of millions or billions of solar masses for the black hole. And also because they're elliptical galaxies, they don't have a lot of gas and dust in the center. So their accretion geometry in the astrophysics is somewhat different from in a spiral galaxy like ours. And if you do simulations of this, or just even the theory on the back of an envelope, uh, you can show that these spinning, rapidly spinning black holes um, without much gas or dust around them will send out extremely energetic beams of plasma, radio jets. And it's the radio jets, really, that we're seeing with our radio telescopes. But if you have a less massive, either a less massive black hole, or a black hole that's not spinning as much, which might be the case in uh, certain types of spiral galaxies, or a black hole which is much more shrouded in gas and dust, then that sort of radio mode of forming jets is either quenched or never happens in the first place. And so those objects do not emit strong radio emission. And that, very roughly, because the astrophysics, of course, is kind of messy in detail, um, is why there are two types of quasar and why some of them just don't have a lot of radio emission. OK, our next question. 
is concerning gravity waves. How would we differentiate one change in mass distribution from all the noise of the galaxy? Yeah, gravity waves is, uh, is going to be a challenge. Um, we think that they get made in nature because we trust general relativity. It's passed all its tests so far, and gravity waves have been observed at least indirectly. Um, so when LIGO and these other facilities come online in their next versions, which should be able to detect uh, in falling, uh, you know, in spiraling black holes and neutron stars, it is indeed a question of measuring against the noise. The fundamental problem of the gravity wave detectors is, is not astrophysical noise or noise from other types of phenomena. The fundamental problems of gravity wave detectors are um, electronic noise, basically shot noise, so it's just the literally the noise, electronic noise from actually electrons in the detector and their thermal motions uh, that just forms kind of static against which the signal must be measured. And then a second type of noise that's equally profound and cannot be overcome by any method is geological noise. So they positioned these gravity wave detectors in the geologically quietest places they could possibly find, but no place is geologically quiet. The Earth is a restless planet. And there's essentially this low-level geological hum. By hum, I mean geological vibrations that are about a tenth of a hertz up to a hertz up to ten hertz. And that, of course, is a very important range for gravity waves. A lot of phenomena people are trying to detect are in that range from like a tenth of a hertz or an oscillation at uh, every tenth of a second to ten hertz, ten oscillations a second. And because the Earth is vibrating that way and you're trying to measure tiny changes in the geometry of a test mass caused by the passage of a gravity wave through them, you cannot distinguish those two things. The geological noise of the Earth is a, is a noise that uh, just interferes with your detection of the changes of space-time caused by gravity waves. So those are the two fundamental kinds of noise against which LIGO has to battle, and where m almost all of the expertise and talent and skills of these engineers and physicists has been dedicated to driving down those noise sources, understanding them as well as possible, and minimizing them. Now, as far as noise, astrophysical signals that constitute noise, that's sort of a question of what the universe produces. So um, going into these experiments, astronomers have simulated the events that they think should be happening out in space. And the most dramatic in terms of gravity waves are when compact objects interact. So that's a black hole uh, orbiting or coalescing with another black hole, a black hole in a neutron star, or two neutron stars. Other events that are going to give strong gravity wave signals are supernovae, where when the collapse, the core collapse, and then the subsequent explosion are not completely symmetric, which is likely to be the case that they're not completely symmetric, or, or even more rare events like hypernovae or the things that give rise to gamma ray bursts. All of these are signature events that we expect to see in gravity wave detectors, but we don't know all the phenomena of the universe. So the physicists who are going to analyze the data stream from LIGO and other detectors uh, are in a tricky situation. They're going to search for the things that they know and understand and can predict and simulate. But the things they don't know or don't understand, the new phenomena the universe might have in store for us, are going to be extremely difficult to detect. They'll have to use filtering techniques to try and dig them out of what, again, is a fundamentally noisy signal for the fundamental geological and electronic reasons that I suggested. So this is a, is a challenge. Everyone's incredibly excited about LIGO, but I don't think anyone, even on the project, would pretend that they have optimized the detection of all the things they could possibly detect. And they're very worried about the unanticipated phenomena that they don't know how to model, and therefore they don't know how to detect. How do you dig that out of this, this noisy, stream of data. It's an unsolved problem. Um, and it's what keeps LIGO scientists up at night, apart from worrying whether their phase B detector will work at the level they think it needs to to detect real astrophysical effects in a year or so. Okay. 
Our next question is from Alice Amanda. Where did the methane on Mars come from? Did it come from volcanoes? So Mars methane is still a bit of an enigma. Um, but to remind everyone, methane is interesting on a potentially habitable planet because it's a biomarker. Uh, I think, I forget the exact fraction, but I think between half and the two-thirds of the methane in the Earth's atmosphere comes from biological activity. A lot of it comes from ruminants, basically cow frogs. Um, the level of methane on the Earth is thousands of times higher than the level of methane on Mars. So Mars has had methane measured by multiple missions, multiple orbiters, so there's no doubt that Mars has methane in its very thin atmosphere. It's at a level of a few parts per billion, the really low levels of trace methane. Where does it come from? Simply, we simply do not know. That level of methane is so small that it can come from a variety of possibility, possible mechanisms. One, of course, is biology. If we don't think life exists on the surface of Mars, we don't think it can. But it certainly could and can below the surface in aquifers where the water is kept liquid by pressure and some geological heating. And so if there were microbes in these subsurface aquifers, and some of them are metabolizing methane, which is what microbes on the Earth did billions of years ago, and some still do, then that methane would seep up and we'd see it in the atmosphere. So absolutely, biological activity is a possible explanation for Mars methane. But also, it's ge simple ge geochemical activity or interactions are also possible. So geologists came back very quickly after the astrobiologists got excited about this discovery and said, no, wait a minute. We can make methane just from simple interactions of rocks from heating within the interior and, it, and add the presence of water to, to facilitate chemical reactions. And you can get methane in ways that have nothing to do with biology, especially at that tiny level of a few parts per billion. If it was like a few parts per million, the geologists couldn't explain it. And then you're pretty much looking at biology. So the level of methane is so low that it's essentially impossible right now uh, to, 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 to decide between normal, boring geology and exciting biology. The other thing that's going on, however, is that the methane is variable. It's variable both in its location and its time variable over the few years that it's been studied. And that got the astrobiologists all excited again because they said, well, no, wait a minute. A variable methane, even at this low level, seems much more likely to be biological than geological. But again, the to and fro continued, and the geologist said, wait a minute, no, no. The geology of this is variable and can be time variable, too, and location specific. So basically, none of these arguments have been decided. Um, it's fascinating to watch, as a, essentially, as an outsider. I just hear about it from my colleagues and experts in the field. Um, so we need more information. I mean, it's yet another reason to have better information about Mars than we do now because um, we've not been able to decide this issue of where the source of the methane is and and, both, and the biological possibility is still on the table. I probably should wrap up in a few minutes. Okay, so maybe one more. And just as a, and I'll even tag on to that because I was doing a, a we're on Google Hangout. I was doing a Hangout yesterday, hosted by Scientific American, Joanne Manister. And um, that was really triggered by um, the fact that I wrote a book on space missions recently, Dreams of Other Worlds, and then also by um, the MAVEN mission, which is heading off to Mars. Now, MAVEN's not actually going to address methane directly. Methane is one of the things it's actually going to measure. But the MAVEN mission is due to launch in a couple, in three weeks, about three weeks, um, and so we were talking in this live session about space missions and planetary science and what's exciting. And so I'll just mention MAVEN because it's upcoming. And it's uh, a very important mission because it's, it's, an, it's an orbiter. It's not one of the landers or rovers. It's going to have a very looping elliptical orbit which swoops down to within about 100 kilometers of the surface, which is still pretty high, but enough to sniff the atmosphere. So. MAVEN is designed really to actually answer a more fundamental question than methane on Mars. It's designed to answer the question of where did Mars' atmosphere go? Because if we think Mars was habitable three billion years ago and it had a 
and it was warm and wet enough to have liquid water on the surface, it must have had a, a greenhouse effect and a much thicker atmosphere. And it's a really big question for planetary scientists as to where that atmosphere went and how did it uh, evaporate or drift off into space and why was not any of it replenished. And so MAVEN is a nice little orbiter that will go off in a few weeks. The, or the, threat, the uh, launch of MAVEN was under threat while the government was shut down, but luckily they came back to work at NASA in time to launch it, and it's going to answer where our Mars atmosphere went, and along the way, it's sensitive to measuring methane, too. So maybe one more question. Okay. Here's a question from Wayne. On a less serious note, he says, what do you think of the TV show Big Bang Theory? Ah, okay. Well, that's a good one to finish with, actually. Um, I've watched, I, I mean, I'm not a total fan, as in watch it all the time. I've seen every episode. Um, but I've, I've seen Big Bang Theory, and, and it's, it's fun. It's a lot of fun. And it's well done. It's well acted. Uh, it's clever. And the, you know, the creators and the writers clearly, you know, talk to scientists. There's some, some of my esteemed colleagues are consultants on the show. And, of course, as you know, if you watch it, famous scientists occasionally get to do voiceovers or guest appearances. Stephen Hawking, a famous example. But there's other cosmologists that have been in there, too. Um, so what do I think of it? I mean, mostly I think it's great. It's fun. I'm, you know, I enjoy it. I'm fine with it. I guess I hold back from completely enthusiastic slam dunk endorsement just because it does play the stereotypes in a particular way that I don't entirely agree with. I mean, it's, it's a humorous and affectionate way of playing the stereotypes of science or the stereotypes of women in science. And I can just laugh at it and enjoy it. But there's a part of me that thinks, well, you know, this is not entirely the right message that, you know, the, the nerdiness or the way the women in the show appear or so on. It, it's, you know, it's kind of hitting a stereotype that I don't think is completely uh, productive or legitimate or valid. But that's just being too harsh. It's entertaining. You, know, you sort of need to just lighten up and enjoy it as a show. So I do enjoy it. And I think that's all we've got time for today. So we will continue to do this. I'm actually, um, we're going to take a slightly longer break between live sessions than usual because I'm off uh, tomorrow to India to teach my monks, as I like to call them, my Tibetan Buddhist monks that I teach cosmology to every year. I'm off to northern India to teach them in a workshop for a few weeks, and I will be pretty isolated and off the grid for a few weeks, but we'll be back around Thanksgiving to do this again. So thank you all for participating, and hope you keep enjoying the course and keep giving us feedback. That's how we'll make it better. Thank you. <laughs>